וכעת אני מתכבד להציג את המרצה הפותח שלנו, האורח שלנו, פרופסור מנחם רוזנזפט. פרופסור רוזנזפט הוא סגן נשיא הקונגרס היהודי העולמי והיועץ המשפטי שלה, שלו. הוא מרצה בבית הספר למשפטים על רצח עם בקורנל ובאוניברסיטת קולומביה. הוא גם עומד בראש הוועדה המייעצת של קרן הזיכרון של מדינת סקסוניה התחתונה, אשר תחת אחריותה אתרי זיכרון בסקסוניה, גרמניה, כולל מחנה השמדה של ברגן בלזן. הוא גם בנם של ניצולי שואה ממחנה אושוויץ. הוא בן אותות ההוקרה הרבים, לא אלאה אתכם ברשימה ארוכה, אציין אות, את אות הזיכרון על שם אלי ויזל מטעם הבונד של ישראל. בשנת 2003. אם כן, פרופסור מנחם רוזנזפט ידבר על השואה בבולגריה מזווית ראייה יהודית בולגרית. הוא ידבר כמובן באנגלית, ומי שהיה זקוק לתרגום, אני מקווה שיצטייד ב... ואני מניח ש... תודה רבה, thank you very much. Um, Reporting on the Eichmann trial, Hannah Arendt propounded her flawed theory on the banality of evil, by which she meant, inaccurately as it turned out, that Eichmann and other Nazis like him were, quote, neither perverted nor sadistic, end quote, but acted merely as efficient, amoral bureaucrats within a machinery of death. The ongoing controversy over the role of King Boris III of Bulgaria during the Holocaust years illustrates not the banality, but the moral ambiguity of both evil and good. There is an intellectual and emotional sense of security, a complacency, if you will, in dealing with and confronting absolutes, whether it be absolute evil or absolute good. We are comfortable with the understanding, the appreciation, that the perpetrators of the Holocaust, or of any genocide or crime against humanity for that matter, embody and epitomize absolute evil. And we are equally secure in recognizing that the men and women who, often at the risk of their own lives, try to help and protect or rescue the victims of such atrocities, similarly embody and epitomize absolute good. The relevant underlying two-pronged principle, first articulated in the Talmud, is that whoever saved one life is considered to have saved the entire world, and that whoever takes a life is deemed to have destroyed the entire world. This tenet of faith certainly covers the righteous among the nations. It covers genocidaires and other mass murderers, as well as anyone who knowingly facilitates their crimes against humanity. But what are we to make of individuals who do not fall neatly into either of these categories? How do we deal with someone who saved lives and has blood on his hands? In 1963, my father was asked to be a witness for the defense at the Tel Aviv trial of Hirsch Barnblatt, who had been the head of the Jewish police in the ghetto of Benjin in Poland. Barnblatt was accused of collaborating with the Nazis and assisting in the deportation of Jews of, uh, to Auschwitz. His defenders argued that he had worked with the Jewish underground in the ghetto and that he had on occasion used his position to try to save Jews. My father declined the invitation to testify. One of his reasons, he said, was that he knew for a fact that both Barnblatt accusers and his defenders were right. He had collaborated and he had tried to help. Let us now turn our attention to Bulgaria during the years of the Holocaust, where, 
as Michael Berenbaum has accurately noted, and I quote, at one and the same time, some Jews were saved, others persecuted, and still others deported and destroyed. This morning, I would like us to consider whether King or Tsar Boris III of Bulgaria should be hailed as the rescuer of 48,000 Bulgarian Jews, or whether he should be condemned as the man ultimately responsible, or at the very least co-responsible, for the deportation to their death of 11,343 Jews from Thrace, Macedonia, and the formerly Serbian district of Pirot, or whether the truth lies somewhere in the middle. This debate is hardly new. I want to begin our discussion this morning with two letters to the editor published in the New York Times almost 30 years ago that encapsulate and epitomize the essence of events that occurred in Bulgaria between 1940 and 1943. The first of these, published on October 16, 1993, was by uh, Michael Michael Barzohar, at the time a visiting Israeli scholar at the Emory University History Department in Atlanta, Georgia. Beginning from the premise that the Bulgarian rescue of that country's Jews was, in Bar Zohar's words, less known but more dramatic than the Danish rescue of Jews from the Nazis during World War II, Bar Zohar proceeded to set out, for the first time in print, at least to my knowledge, his rather romanticized and factually challenged presupposition on the fate of Bulgarian Jews during the Holocaust. Quote, Bulgaria was Nazi Germany's allies. Its king, Boris III, was a personal friend of Hitler. The fascist party was in power and the country swarmed with German troops. Nevertheless, when Eichmann's deputy, Theodor Daneker, came to Bulgaria to deport the Jews, this small Balkan nation refused to let them go. The young secretary of the Commissar for Jewish Question, Liliana Panitsa, discovered the secret agreement between her employer and the German envoy and hurried to inform Jewish and Bulgarian leaders of the forthcoming deportation. I'm still quoting from Bar Zohar's letter. The news triggered an unprecedented effort led by the Eastern Orthodox Church, several fascist leaders, intellectual and professional groups, and the king himself. Many Bulgarians considered their Jewish compatriots' deportation a stain on Bulgaria's honor. In open defiance of the right, Bulgaria refused to hand over its 50,000 Jews." End quote. Uh, the first problem, of course, is that these 134 quoted words contain a fair number of not insignificant inaccuracies. To begin with, Bulgaria did not swarm with German troops. The country was not occupied by Nazi Germany in the winter and spring of 1943. While SS Hauptsturmführer, rank of captain, Daniker, was an aide to Eichmann and his representative in Bulgaria, Eichmann's actual deputy was SS Sturmbannführer Major Rolf Günther. Liliana or Lili Panitsa, the secretary and lover of Alexander Belev, Bulgaria's commissar for Jewish question, did alert some Bulgarian Jews to Belev and the Bulgarian government's secret plan to deport them. But the second part of uh, Barzoha's reference to her, that she also provided this information to ethnic Bulgarian, that is, non-Jewish leaders, does not appear to have any basis in fact. Her one other involvement I've seen documented is a March 11, 1943 call to an assistant chief of section of the Commissariat for Jewish Question in Pirot to proceed with a roundup of Jews there. Hardly a uh, life-saving activity. And most relevant to our discussion here this week, there is no evidence to suggest that King Boris III, quote, led, end quote, the effort to prevent the deportation of Bulgarian Jews. At most, he was a reactive participant. 
On October 23, 1993, the New York Times published a second letter to the editor, this time by Hebrew University professor Yehuda Bauer, still today one of the doyens of a uh, Holocaust historian, in which he pointed out that while Bar Zohar was right to extol the humanity of Bulgarians during the Holocaust, there was more to the story. It was true, Bauer wrote that, and I quote again, an unlikely alliance of King Boris III, the Eastern Orthodox Church, members of the fascist establishment, and underground communists and socialists managed to save the Jews of old Bulgaria from de deportations to the death camp. However, the Bulgarian regime deported Jews from Sofia and other cities to exile locations within the country and despoiled the Jews of much of their unimpressive property. Professor Barzohar does not mention that the rescue action came after Stalingrad and that the Bulgarians could read the writing on the wall. Most important, he also fails to mention the fact that the Bulgarians delivered 11,343 Jews from Bulgaria's newly conquered territory in Yugoslav Macedonia and Greek Thrace to the Germans, who killed every one of them in the death camps in Poland. It is hardly an untarnished record." End quote. One significant difference between the two letters is their respective characterizations of those involved in preventing the deportation of the 48,000 Bulgarian Jews. Bar Zohar wrote about the, and again I quote, unprecedented effort led by the Eastern Orthodox Church, several fascist leaders, intellectual and professional groups, and the king himself. End quote. Bauer, meanwhile, gave credit to an unlikely alliance of King Boris, the church, members of the fascist establishment, and underground communists and socialists. As I, as I already indicated, Barzohar significantly overstated, and for that matter con continues to overstate, the role played by Boris in, the, in this regard. In contrast, Bauer accurately included Boris among those individuals and groups, what Bauer in, uh, insightfully called an unlikely alliance, who made the rescue possible. And before anyone raises eyebrows, please bear in mind that the mere fact that someone belongs to a collective does not mean or imply that they are a driving or even motivating force of that collective. It is a tremendous honor and privilege for me to speak to you today at this important conference. I want to thank Jackie Comforty for inviting me and including me. Let me say at the outset that unlike most of the other participants in the conference, I am not a historian of the Bulgarian experience during World War II. And I'm humbled to have, the have had the opportunity and to have the opportunity to listen to and interact with some of the scholars and authors who are the true authorities on this topic and whose works have educated and inspired me. I apologize in advance for anyone I inadvertently failed to mention, but I would be remiss if I did not single out, in addition to Jackie, Leah Cohen, Nadej Ragaru, Ruben Abramov, and my good friend of more than 40 years, Michael Bernbaum. I also want to note the absence of two individuals whose accounts of the events in question must be at the heart of our deliberations here this week. First, the outstanding historian, Professor Frederick Cherry, who passed away in November of 2020 from COVID-19, and whose groundbreaking 1972 work, The Bulgarian Jews in the Final Solution, 1940 to 1944, has stood the test of time and remained a critically important resource. Second, we are indebted to the late Franco-Bulgarian philosopher and literary theorist uh, Tsvetan Todorov, who the fragility of goodness, why Bulgaria's Jews survived the Holocaust, has given us access to the often contemporaneous words and perspectives of some of the principal protagonists and antagonists not to say heroes and villains, of the events culminating in both the survival of over 48,000 Bulgarian Jews 
and the knowing betrayal by Boris and his government of 11,343 Jews from Macedonia, Thrace, and Pyrrhus. A brief summary of the highlights of this human drama seems in order here, even though this audience is fully familiar with them. King Boris III ascended his country's throne on October 3, 1918, following his father's abdication, and beginning in 1935 was the authoritarian ruler of Bulgaria until his sudden and suspicious death on August 28, 1943. In the 1936 sixth edition of Inside Europe Today, John Gunther, the legendary chronicler of the interwar European political scene, accurately referred to the Bulgarian government at the time as, quote, the king's government. It would remain so. Boris himself does not appear to have been a fascist, but even while professing neutrality during the 1930s, he developed a friendship of sort with Hitler. Boris was Hitler's special guest at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. The Germanophile Bogdan Filov, an archaeologist and art historian who had studied at universities in Germany, was appointed by Boris as Bulgaria's prime minister in February of 1940. Filov, undoubtedly with Boris's knowledge and consent, appointed the openly pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic Petar Gab Gabrovsky to the influential position of Minister of the Interior. Gabrovsky, in turn, brought another outspoken fascist and virulent anti-Semite, the aforementioned Alexander Belev, into his ministry. Shortly thereafter, several significant events occurred in relatively rapid succession. First, Belev drafted and Gabrovsky engineered the enactment of the law for the defense of the nation, which, like the Third Reich's notorious Nuremberg Law on which it was modeled, imposed significant legal restrictions on Bulgaria's Jews. Its purpose, according to Gabrovsky as cited by Lea Cohen, was, quote, to protect the national purity of the Bulgarians from the Jews, who, as part of international Jewry, are alien to the Bulgarian national spirit, end quote. In Adej Ragaru's word, this law, which was signed by Boris on January 15, 1941, A, set the stage for identifying and socially and economically marginalizing Jews, and B, ensured the segregation of Jews and non-Jews, including the banning of mixed marriages and of Bulgarian household staff being employed by Jews. The law for the defense of the nation, incidentally, was followed in short order by the law for the settlement of land property for persons of Jewish origin and the law for the taxing of Jewish population. As Professor Rumiana Marinova Christidi of Sofia University has observed, anti-Semitism had become state policy. Second. On March 1, 1941, Bulgaria formally allied itself with Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan. Third, in April 1941, following Germany and Italy's military defeat of Yugoslavia and Greece, Bulgaria assumed military and administrative control over Macedonia, Thrace, and Pirot. By a Bulgarian government decree of June 5, 1942, quote, all Yugoslav and Greek subject of non-Bulgarian origin, end quote, residing in these territories acquired Bulgarian citizenship. However, Article 4 of this same Bulgarian decree expressly excluded person of Jewish origin from such Bulgarian citizenship, except for married Jewish women, presumably married to non-Jewish husbands. Then, on August 29, 1942, the die was effectively cast for the Jews of Bulgaria, Macedonia, Thrace, and Pirot, with the establishment of the Commissariat for Jewish Questions headed by Alexander Belis. On February 22, 1943, Belis signed an agreement with Eichmann's representative, Doniker, to deport 20,000 Jews the following month all the Jews living in Thrace, Macedonia, and Pirot, 
and the balance from Bulgaria proper, often referred to as Old Bulgaria. Plans for these deportation were meant to be kept secret, but at the beginning of March, news of the imminent tragedy independently came to the attention of a number of individuals. As already mentioned, Lily Panitza, Bella's secretary and lover, secret, separately informed the vice president and a former president of the Central Consistory of Jews in Bulgaria of what was about to happen. The mayor of the southern Bulgarian town of Kustendil alerted a Jewish friend that a train with empty boxcars had arrived at the station and that the town's Jews were about to be taken away. A delegation from Kustendil then traveled to Sofia where they enlisted the help of Dimitar Peshev, the deputy speaker of the Bulgarian National Assembly and a former minister of justice. Peshev, who had already been told of this development by Yakub Baruch, a Zionist activist in Sofia, went all out to try to stop the deportation, in effect sacrificing his political career by confronting Filov and Gabrovsky, eventually enlisting other parliamentarians as well. Peshev would later write that, quote, I made the decision to do everything in my power to prevent the execution of a plan that was going to compromise Bulgaria in the eyes of the world and brand it with a mark of shame that it did not deserve, end quote. Meanwhile, two metropolitans of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, Stefan of Sofia and Kirill of Plovdiv, also got wind of the impending deportation and spoke out forcefully, both publicly and privately, against them. Kirill went so far as to threaten in a telegram to Boris that he would lie on the railroad track to prevent the train from leaving. In due course, Peshev, Metropolitan Stefan and Kirill, and other members of Bulgarian civil society prevailed on Boris not to allow the deportation of the Jews from old Bulgaria but he adamantly refused to block or even speak out against the deportation of the Jews from Macedonia, Thracia, and Pirot. Boris also agreed to have the Jews expelled from Sofia and several other cities, and many Bulgarian Jews were sent to labor camps. No one should be left with any doubt regarding the harsh conditions Bulgarian Jews were forced to endure after being forced to leave Sofia at the end of May 1943. Leah Cohen writes, and I quote, in the deportation sites, the Jews were placed in terrible condition, accommodated in houses and barracks in the Gypsy and Turkish neighborhood, without the right of free movement, deprived of all means of subsistence, and even without household goods. They remained in these conditions until the Red Army entered Bulgaria, after which they began their chaotic return to their native places, where they found their homes occupied and their belongings stolen. They did not have any money, as their bank accounts had been blocked as early as 1941 and subsequently confiscated for the use of the Commissariat for Jewish Affairs. Already money and valuables had also been seized. The details of the relevant and complex chronology can be found in, among other works, Jackie Comforty, The Stolen Narrative of the Bulgarian Jews in the Holocaust, written with Martha Bloomfield, Nadej Ragaru's Il est juif bulgare fut sauvé, Leah Cohen's recently published Salvation, Persecution, and the Holocaust in the Kingdom of Bulgaria, 1940-1944, as well as the previously referenced book by Frederick Chary and Svetan Todorov. In a way, Boris is emblematic of the inherent difficulty in coming to terms with what occurred in Bulgaria during the years of the Holocaust. While he may have anti-Semitic views and at least on one occasion expressed these views quite forcefully, he does not appear to have disliked Jews viscerally or even ideologically. On the contrary, if Stefan Gruer's account is to be believed, Boris not only inter interacted positively with the Bulgarian Jewish community, Frederick Chari note that as late as uh, the summer of 1942, Boris sent a telegram to Joseph Geron, the president of the Central Consistory, Consistory of the Jews in Bulgaria, 
thanking him and the Jewish community for their good wishes on the occasion of Crown Prince Simeon's fifth birthday, but he maintained friendly relationship with individual Jews, including his dentists and the court-appointed closier. This, of course, uh, is reminiscent of the classic protestation of many an anti-Semite that some of my best friends are Jewish. At the same time, there is no question that Boris owned the law for the defense of the nation, the establishment for the Commissariat for Jewish Questions, the discriminatory measures taken against Bulgarian Jews, <coughs> and at the top of the anti-Semitic credentials, the deportation from Macedonia, Thrace, and Pira. These deportations, incidentally, were planned and directed by Belev, who reported to Gabrovsky, and thus was subject to Boris's ultimate control, and they were implemented by Bulgarian police and military units that were also under the king's control. Contemporary protestations, such as those by former King Simeon II, who as Simeon Saksa Koburgota was Prime Minister of Bulgaria from 2001 until 2005, that Bulgaria's and hence Boris's, quote, influence over the so-called new land was very limited, or that in the year of World War II it was the Wehrmacht and Gestapo that had the decisive word on the fate of the new land, are to be charitable, unsupported by the facts. Far more assertive is Dimitar Pesha's unambiguous assertion that, quote, in fact, there were no differences between these territories, that is, Macedonia, Thrace, and Pirot, and other regions of Bulgaria in terms of their administration, end quote. It is also noteworthy that at a meeting with Stefan Kirill and the other metropolitans of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, Boris expressed what were probably his true, true views of the Jews. According to the protocol of Boris's speech to the small cabinet of the Holy Synod, Synod on April 15, 1943, which were uh, already quoted yesterday, he emphasized, and I quote, the enormous harm inflicted on humanity for centuries by the profiteering spirit of the Jews. This spirit has created hatred, loss of faith, moral degeneracy, and treason among men everywhere. This spirit of profiteering and negation has created and still creates discontent, quarrel, conflict, wars, and calamities among people and society. The present global cat cataclysm is in large measure the fruit of this profiteering spirit." End quote. In order to place Boris's attitude and action in context, an, overlook, an often overlooked paragraph of Justice Robert H. Jackson's opening address at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg is instructive. Jackson, as we all know, was Chief of Counsel for the United States at the historic trial of Hermann Goering, Joachim von Ribbentrop, Alfred Rosenberg, Hans Frank, and 17 other senior officials of the Third Reich. Uh, referring to the defendant in the dock, Jackson said, quote, I know very well that some of these men did take steps to spare some particular Jew for some personal reason from the horror that awaited the unrescued Jew. Some protested that particular atrocity were excessive and discredited the general policy. While a few defendants may show effort to make specific exceptions to the policy of Jewish extermination, I have found no instance in which any defendant opposed the policy itself or sought to revoke or even modify it. I believe the caveat expressed by Jackson is instructive in our consideration of Boris's behavior with, res re with regard to Bulgarian Jewry, as well as the ultimate Jews, ultimately do doomed Jews of Thrace, Macedonia, and Pirot. No one denies that he played a role and, to paraphrase Justice Jackson, did take steps in saving not just some particular Jew for some personal reason, but 48,000 Jews from annihilation. But there also appears to be a broad consensus that Boris only did so 
after Peshev, Metropolitan Stefan and Kirill, and others in Bulgarian civil society had publicly expressed their outrage at the planned deportation. Even Michael Barzohar, who is one of the most prominent Boris apologists, conceded in a 2013 videotaped talk at the American University in Bulgaria that, and I quote because it's relevant here, under the pressure of the pro-fascist majority of the parliament, under the pressure of the church, after all these petitions of the people, he, that is Boris, suddenly realizes that he can't be the king of the Bulgarians and became, behave against the Bulgarian spirit. And then, two hours before the deportation, he issued the order, not one Jew leave Bulgaria. Does it really matter, should it matter in this context, whether Boris was a catalyst or a catalyst of the chain of events that led to this result, or whether his role was dictated by pragmatism, political opportunism, or some other reason. I submit to you that how we answer this question is an essential consideration in our assessment of Boris. In the final analysis, there is a pronounced difference between someone who does what we would call the right thing independently, proactively, out of a sense of moral or humanitarian urgency, and someone who does so reactively as a matter of calculated expediency or because they do not want the public opprobrium of not having done so. Still, to quote uh, Svetan Todorov, from 10 March 1943 until his death on 28 August of that year, the king held firm to the position that the Jews were not to be deported. Fair enough. But as Yehuda Bauer pointed out <coughs> in his uh, 1993 letter to the editor of the New York Times, there is more, far more to the story. While Boris was involved in the maneuvering to keep the Jews of old Bulgaria in Bulgaria, he did not, to paraphrase Justice Jackson, take any steps whatsoever to spare the Jews of Macedonia, Straits, and Pirot from the horrors that awaited them. Metropolitan Stefan, for one, begged him to do so on several occasions, but to no avail. Boris could, for example, have accorded these foreign Jews Bulgarian citizenship, since it was a decree from his government that had precluded them from acquiring this citizenship in the first place. Or he could have simply ordered that they not be deported. Or he could have at least spoken out publicly on their, their behalf. It is safe to assume that he considered these Jews to be expendable, and the price, perhaps in his view a small price, he and Bulgaria had to pay to at least somewhat satisfy his friend Hitler and Bulgaria's ally Germany. Thus, Borisly consciously allowed them to be rounded up, detained in tobacco warehouses, and ultimately put on trains bound for Treblinka by Bulgarian soldiers and policemen. In this respect, Boris's actions, or non-actions, are reminiscent of Pierre Laval, the Prime Minister of the Nazi collaborationist Vichy regime government, who told German and other correspondents at a news conference in September of 1942 that he intended to continue deporting alien Jews, that is, refugees and other Jews who did not hold French citizenship from France. Quote, no man and nothing, Laval declared, can sway me from my determination to rid France of alien Jews and send them back where they came from. The record is clear that Boris did nothing, absolutely nothing, and uttered not one word to help the Jews in Macedonia, Thrace, and Pirot. Instead, as Svetan Todorov also stated categorically, and I quote, the king was, in fact, responsible for the deportation to the death camp of 11,343 people, end quote. Incidentally, under Article 6 of the Charter of the International Military Tribunal and under Article 7 and 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, 
This deportation falls four square within the definition of both a war crime and a crime against humanity. And the failure on the part of the present day Bulgarian government to publicly and un unequivocally acknowledge that Bulgarians perpetrated this war crime and crime against humanity is a gross dereliction of its responsibility to the murdered Jews of Macedonia, Thrace, and Pirot and to history. It also violates the government's obligation to, and I quote, safeguard the historical record, end quote, on which Bulgaria's membership in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance is predicated. Our inherent problem... Our inherent problem is that ignoring, minimizing, or distorting one side of a ledger is in and of itself a form of Holocaust distortion. That is why, as Dalia Offer has chronicled, a plaque honoring Boris and Queen Giovanna was removed from a Jewish national fund forest in Israel after survivors from Thrace and Macedonia and their descendants objected strenuously. That is also why, earlier this year, leaders of the Jewish community of Bulgaria boycotted a government-organized ceremony meant to mark the 80th anniversary of the rescue of Bulgarian Jewry during the Holocaust, including a tribute to Boris and Queen Giovanna. Dr. Alexander Oscar, president of the Organization of the Jews in Bulgaria, Shalom, explained their absence from the event by saying, Nobody from the community would have taken part in an event honoring the imaginary role of King Boris in rescuing the Bulgarian Jews and presenting a distorted history of the Holocaust. Quote, what we choose to remember and what we choose to omit when telling our own history is a mark of wisdom, courage, and dignity. <coughs> Bulgarian Jewish journalist Emi Baru wrote on March 9, 2023, in an open letter to Bulgarian President Ruman Radev. There is no morality to be found in the sinister arithmetic that the lives of 50,000 were paid for by the lives of 11,343. Omitting half of the somber equation turned the 80th anniversary of the rescue into another episode of political exploitation of Bulgarian Jews. All of which leaves us with the realization that while there are absolutes of good and evil, the human condition also inevitably incorporates an ambiguity in both good and evil. As Ruman Abramov, Abramov has written, the strength of evil and the permeability of moral fibers are the unavoidable counterpart of Tretan Fodorov's fragility of goodness. Dimitar Peshev, Metropolitan Stefan and Metropolitan Kirill represent absolute good. All three have long been recognized as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. Petar Gabrovsky and Alexander Belev, meanwhile, represent absolute evil. Gabrovsky was executed and Belev killed after the Red Army took control of Bulgaria in 1944. I don't think anyone is shedding any tears over either of them. And King Boris III, he falls somewhere in between. He has checked marks on both sides of the ledger, a ledger which, as Emi Baru points out, must be considered in its entirety. Accordingly, both the absolute demonization of Boris and the blind mythologized glorification of his action during World War II especially in the late winter and spring of 1943, are unconscionable distortions of history. To be valid, history must be predicated on an absolute, uncompromising truth, not manipulation. Eighty years ago, 48,000 Jews were not deported from Bulgaria, while 11,343 other Jews were cruelly loaded on trains bound for Treblinka where they were murdered. 
These are two interdependent realities that cannot be and must not be allowed to be uncoupled. The fact that 48,000 Bulgarian Jews were saved in no way diminishes the tragedy and in no way mitigate the horror of the 11,343 Jews who were sent to their death at the behest of the government of King Boris III. And the fact that the Jews of Macedonia, Thrace, and Pirot were deported to be killed takes nothing away from the equal truth that the same King Boris was part of, in Yehuda Bauer's word, the unlikely alliance that kept the Jews of old Bulgaria from suffering the same fate. I thank you. Toda Rabba, le Professor Rosenzaft, Professor Menachem Rosenzaft, a la Arzaa, ha melumedet, ha menumeket, shematziga bemet mechkar, veani tohe baketa ze. I wonder it's also because you are coming from a different position as a general counsel of the uh, World Jewish Congress. Kemishpetan, gam reinu nituach, ve gam hatsarot, shem kubalot bederech klal, bifi mishpetanim, shem hapsim gam et hatsedek, velorak nituach shal uvdot. As ine, ishir ze, patach lefanenu ta diun hayom, ve anachnu modim lo, ani mivin, Dr. Mosek, anachnu belach.